Hello everyone and welcome to the celebration of International Translation Day at Rutgers, organized and sponsored by the new Translation Studies Initiative, the Department of English, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, the Language Center, and the Translation and Interpreting Program in the Spanish Department. My name is Laura Ramirez and I'm the coordinator of the Translation and Interpreting Program in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, as well as of Translation and Interpreting Initiatives within the Humanities. We have uh, roughly 60 minutes for today's session, which means that after our speaker has finished her presentation, which will be around 40 minutes, there'll be plenty of time for questions. We're using the Zoom format, so please use the chat or unmute your mic and show your camera and ask your question. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, who is Sonia Colina. Sonia is Regents Professor of Spanish and Portuguese and Director of the National Center of Interpretation at the University of Arizona, where she teaches Spanish linguistics and translation studies. In her translation studies research, she specializes in applied linguistics and translation, translation quality, assessment, pedagogy and of translation, and translator education. Her presentation today will deal with translation in the multilingual language classroom as a fifth or additional skill for the language learner, reading, writing, listening, speaking, and translating, and as an activity that promotes literacy, metalinguistic and cultural awareness, translanguaging, and linguistic diversity. Without further ado, let me hand over now to Sonia. The title of Sonia's presentation today is Translation in Language Teaching, Past, Present, and Future. Thank you, Sonia. The floor is yours. My goal is to present ideas in, in the hope of generating discussion about the future of translation in language teaching. And uh, I like to frame those with some reflections in the past and the present and also present some illustrative activities. In terms of the past, I like to just have a future, a few ideas and thoughts about how do we get here. Uh, and that includes some, a reflection on the history of language teaching methodologies in connection with translation. And I'll talk a little bit about the future and then some predictions, uh, some informed predictions, hopefully, uh, about the future, including a call to action due to uh, forward. Okay. Um, so just some initial thoughts um, that I was referring to earlier um, that uh, we do know that the 21st century has actually seen a growing interest in translation and interpreting in the language classroom. And uh, we're not just saying this in an impressionistic way, but this has been reflected in the number of publications we've seen starting in the early 2000s, some of my own work in 2002. Uh, at that point, you know, in Cook 2001, which was really a seminal publication in this regard, at that point, there was still some pushback. Not everyone was really interested in this. However, uh, I have noticed that starting in the second um, decade of the 21st century, the pace has really accelerated. Now, this has not always been this way. And this is why I like to talk a little bit about the past. Can you see things OK now? Still working? Yeah. OK, good. good. So please, please interrupt me. Don't don't stop and uh, don't hesitate to stop me. Right. If it doesn't work again. OK, here we go about the past. Um, you know, you've probably all who work in, trans in, in translation pedagogy have translation from a professional point of view and work in language departments where we do a lot of language teaching. Uh, you've probably noticed this, that for quite a while, for most of the 20th century, Translation was sort of a dirty word for language mm -hmm. teachers and researchers. You were not allowed to use translation in your classroom, but even if you brought it up and talked about it, you actually, you know, were, got a weird look, right? So, um, so most of the 20th century, in particular, the second half, translation was sort of banned. That's what I like to, uh, uh, the terms that I like in general. But how do we get there? How do we get translation and language teaching get its bad reputation? Well, first of all, it was um, associated with grammar translation. So the translation of isolated decontextualized sentences as it was used for teaching language at the beginning of the 20th century. So then of course, people thought that this was translation is about and didn't want anything to do with that. But also we have a number of methods in the second half of the 20th century, such as the direct method or communicative language in which only the L2 
was allowed. So of course, if we only have the L2, then translation is not an option. So then what were the reasons for using only the L2? And these are from Cook, uh, who back in 2001 already argued in favor of bringing translation back to the language classroom. And he uh, goes through all the arguments against it and debunks all of them, presents counter arguments of how this is not actually idea that but anyway so the reasons for using only the l2 is that the language the first language and the second language are considered to be two totally separate systems and the second language was thought to be acquired pretty much like the l1 so in our classrooms we had a lot of um, attempts to try to reproduce that language that first language acquisition uh, environment even though everybody knew that it wasn't quite the same but try to approximate that as much as possible Another reason was that teachers wanted to take the opportunity in the classroom to use as much to as possible. Mm -hmm. However, there are also good reasons for using the L1, and these are some of the kind of arguments that COVID 2001 um, uses. Um, we do know that uh, bilingual is not the sum of two monolinguals, especially today. There's a lot of work done in bilingualism that tells us that the two languages are interrelated, but they're not separate. Also, uh, we want students today to acquire translanguage skills. Uh, we want students to be able to link their two languages in their minds. They're not separate. They're not different people with two different personalities, but it's the same bilingual person who has two languages in, in his or her mind. And therefore, those uh, we want to be able to connect them. Uh, and also people never really entirely stopped using translation uh, in the language classroom. So we wanna replace that under the table, illegal use with actually informed use of translation. So that's a little bit about the past and how we got to where we are today, the present. What about the present? What has changed? Why do we have a lot more interest now in translation and language teaching? Well, in the first place, um, there is uh, the new methodologies that are popular today in language teaching actually promote the use of the L1 and the L2, both languages. These are methodologies that do not ban the L1, actually promote it and encourage it. Uh, I'm sorry, not the L1, but the, the L2. Yes, I'm, I'm right. Yeah, the L1, and not just exclusively the L2, like uh, I was talking about before earlier about the. Um, the direct method in the coming in communicative language teaching. Some of these methodologies, if you those of you who are in language, of course, know about them are multi literacies, critical literacies, cultural and symbolic competence. So once the methodologies have changed, and once they allow us to bring back the L1 into the classroom, then really the door opens for translation in language teaching. Also on the translation side, um, a concept a new view and broader conceptual definition of translation, professional translation, has actually facilitated this change. And in, in this view of translation is cross linguistic mediation, um, talk broader in a broader sense, staying away from just this kind of more narrow view of translation that people tend to associate with grammar translation. Once this becomes more mainstream, it also facilitates the change. So in that regard, uh, this, this broader view of translation defines, looks into translated text as a text that fulfills or attempts to fulfill a specific function in a target culture. And this is in accordance with uh, a set of explicit or implicit instructions. And those of you who are in translation studies will recognize this is the translation brief. But in addition, the translated text is different. It's not an original text. So it bears some type of relationship a translation relationship to another text in another language. And what this relationship is and what type of correspondence may vary depending on the culture or certain notions of translation or also uh, on the specifications of the translation brief. Uh, I also want to state that the way I see a translation text, and most people in translation studies this, these days see it the same way, is that a translated text is the result of the interaction between a source text so social participants. It's not just the text in isolation, but we have to consider the writer or writers of the source, the target language audience, the translators, and of course, a purpose of purposes. All right, so I would like also to uh, mention what I see, what, uh, what 
Albert Leffer and I see as benefits of translation and language teaching in our article in 2017. So I'm going to I'll give you a brief introduction to about five benefits that we propose. Of course, there are more than that. But these are multilingual or multicultural benefits. There are benefits, multilinguistic benefits. There are, in addition, benefits of benefits. And then also the idea of translation as a skill in itself, a fifth skill. What do I mean by multilingual multicultural benefit? Well, um, I believe that the, the goal of language teaching should not be creating native speakers of a second language, should not be native speakerism, but actually the ability to move comfortably between languages. And there's no doubt that translation helps with this. And also those for uh, border crossing, for border dissolving, for working with more than one culture, for noticing similarities and differences across languages and cultures. In terms of literacy benefits, and here I find a lot of these very useful in my own classes. Um, translation helps language students with reading comprehension of the source text. There's, there's all kinds of evidence that tells us that when people read to translate, they read differently, they read, they pay more attention. Also in terms of writing, translation can be understood, can be seen as an writing activity. Um, a lot of language students, when they're given a writing assignment, sometimes they're overwhelmed, especially if they're beginners, because they have to think about many things at the same time. It's not just trying to express their thoughts in a new language, but also trying to organize these thoughts and trying to figure out what it is that they're going to say and how they're going to say it. So it is difficult even for them and they're, if they're English speakers in their English composition classes, it's difficult enough for them to try to get this, those ideas. Now we're asking them to also do it in which is the first language. So if we ask them to translate, then we can see translation as a little bit of, you know, trying to learn the bike with the, with the wheels, right? With the little wheelies in the back before we let them go and let them loose. It helps them a little bit. It makes them feel a little more confident. Also, translation helps with organization and decision making. And it can also be useful in, we think, in terms of uh, multiliteracies in the transform practice component of this model in which we apply knowledge in real world situations. We make new meaning and transform prior uh, knowledge. Linguistic benefits, these have been generally in the literature have been uh, probably the benefits that have been stressed uh, the most. Um, but translation helps with metalinguistic awareness and it helps us, uh, it helps the students see the linguistic system as a whole versus the discrete parts that sometimes they get to see in their language classes because of course we gotta break it up for them but they need to be able to see that we're talking about a whole system. Also it helps with vocabulary. Um, forces to notice specific words. There's no going around with the periphrases or, or, or paraphrase. Um, and that pushes the output. It forces them to come up with, with certain words that, like I said, they might be able, they might be able to get around. There's definitely benefits for heritage speakers. There's uh, a lot of work like the work of uh, Laura Gasca Jimenez and Chris Mellinger in, in um, translation and heritage speakers, it clearly demonstrates that translation helps the heritage speakers connect with their own personal experiences. A lot of these students uh, um, have lived experiences in which they have worked as translators and interpreters. So rather than put down that kind of experience, it's good for us to elevate it and help them use that and connect with their own life um, and, and in terms of that experience. It helps with critical language awareness with the understanding of social linguistic and social political goals and with linguistic skills too. Uh, heritage speakers can also, through translation, learn how to acquire uh, additional dialects, how to switch registers, and it also translation normalizes practices of heritage language speakers. And finally, another benefit which I think uh, has not been has not been stressed enough in language teaching is that Translation is something that a language learner is always going to do. It's not just you know listening, speaking, reading, uh, but they're also going to be translated. The minute that you give them even the rudimentary uh, beginnings of a second language, they're going to start translating. 
So this can be seen as a fifth skill. I know I'm aware that people talk about culture as a fifth skill, but you know, maybe you have to decide which is the fifth and which one's the sixth. The point is, of course, that translation is an additional skill that's important to have for someone who is bilingual. And rather than let the students do it their own way, it'd be good to do it, to teach them a little bit and do it in an informed way and have an awareness of what the field is about. Okay, so now that I've presented a little bit about, you know, the interest in language teaching and, uh, and translation in language teaching, uh, the past, how translation was banned, um, and now in a future in which uh, we see a lot more interest for a number of reasons, for methodolog methodological reasons in terms of language methodologies, in terms of a new definition of translation as, as something broader. Now we get to the what I think is the interesting part to think about the future and try to make a number of informed predictions. And here's, I hope, where I can generate some ideas and discussion. So I'm going to be presenting some of my own um, speculative thoughts, um, hopefully again with some um, important on teaching and research and translation. And teaching. Okay, so what I anticipate in terms of teaching is that there will be continued growth in terms of curricula, textbooks, activities that incorporate translation in the language classroom. I've given you a number of, of references there. And of course, I can, uh, I can share the, the slides later if you're interested in more of the detail. Um, in terms of research, I mm -hmm. see the same thing happening. An increase in research output. Specifically, I think it will continue to grow in the area in heritage, of uh, heritage language translation to uh, better understand how um, heritage learners uh, learn how to translate, how they use it. Um, because obviously in the United States, um, heritage speakers are in all different languages. Of course, Spanish is very important, but all languages are a very important part of our language. Um, um, second language, third language um, speaker population are bilingual and multilingual population. And I think there will be more and more evidence pointing to the benefits of translational language teaching. In, in, the, in terms of in connection with the benefits that I mentioned, and people I'm sure will come up with me once. Um, in terms of a call to action, what shall we do to push the field forward, to move it forward? Well, in terms of institutions that want to improve the use of translation and language learning, they want to support students so they can engage with translation in an informed manner. Um, I think we have to we have to consider and we institutions that actually uh, focus on incorporating translation activities, more translation activities in language teaching. Then I'll talk about also how they'll shoot up more courses programs and research programs. But for now, let's think about how to incorporate translation activities in language teaching. If we're going to do that in an informed way, um, there's a lot of language instructors and in, in language departments in, in colleges, in, in community colleges, and also in high schools in the US. So therefore, it's important that we offer teacher training and education. So more training opportunities are definitely needed. And teachers are going to need to know how to use translation in a informed manner to full grammar translation and fall back into all routines. So I've provided there a couple of a few references of some work that I've been doing with Sada Albrecht at the University of Arizona through some funding uh, through our Title VI Center Circle. And some of this work includes webinars, workshops, but also just um, manual um, on how to design on, uh, translation materials for the language classroom. This is an open source book, so anyone can access it. And uh, I can give you a on how to do it when I share the slides. Um, so what I wanted to do is just give you a little taste of what we've been doing uh, in terms of this manual, this book, and also <clears throat> some of the webinars and presentations. So what I'll do is I'll first run through, uh, without taking too much of your time, but run through some steps for implementing translation activities, and then provide uh, an example of one potential, one possible activity and how it goes also um, through those steps. So what are the steps we see here? 
Well, first, um, we think it's important to determine what it is that your students can do. Obviously, this is this is an important for any class, but it is important in terms of thinking about it and giving it some some conscious thought before we get started to sign in translation activities. Um, the second would be uh, to determine if you have content to build around. Step three, what are our goals or objectives? Um, four, plan the activity, and five, assess and reflect on what we've done. I've already talked a little bit about determining what students can do. What type of activity are we going to do? What is the level and adaptive if we need to? Adaptation is always possible. Step two, determine if we have content to build around. Um, in a multi-literacies framework, the transform practice problem would actually come as a follow-up activity. So for instance, uh, we could have been in the language teaching classroom, could have been reading a certain type of text. So now to transform that practice, we could ask the students to translate the text, of course, with certain instructions, with some, um, some practice, not just go ahead and translate it, but you know, when we first work on our reading and then we can have a translation activity on the, on the text that we've been reading. Goals are important and we could start, it would be possible to start with the goals and objectives of Colina and Lafford 2017 that I mentioned earlier, linguistic or cultural literacy, trans language and negotiation of meaning. What is it that we wanna do with this activity? It's important to not just think and hope that it'll do something, but to just be very intentional about it and decide what it is that we want to do. It doesn't have to be one goal, it could be a couple of them. Let's you know, be conscious about it and think which one it is that we want to work on. The actful can do statements are also can be helpful to narrow down objectives. Uh, then, of course, then once we've done all this preliminary work, we plan the activity. And if this is going to be one of the first activities that you've done, uh, with translation in your language teaching classroom, you might want to take, as your point of departure, one of the examples of published works and modify it according to your needs rather than start from scratch. As I said earlier, then uh, we can always uh, put into the, the levels of the learners. But of course, as I said, this is something you need to think about ahead of time and plan. Um, then finally, uh, assess and reflect. We can use our own translation product as learning assessments. We can look at the translation that the students have done in that regard. Uh, it's also important to learn on, to reflect on the students' learning and the logistics of implementation. And a good idea is always to include the students in the reflection process so that they feel that they're part of the process and we empower them. Okay. And I've looked at the steps. Let me give you an example that actually goes through those um, steps. Um, okay, so this has to do with uh, a questionnaire. Here's the lesson plan, just an overview. Um, the students in this activity were expected or are expected to find out what types of music you listen to. So the first assign a questionnaire in English, we translated to administer it in, in English and in Spanish to Spanish speaking youth and uh, they report the results. So now I'm gonna quickly, don't want to spend much time because it might be a little repetitive. I've already gone through the steps, but I'll go through the steps to give you the specifics of this activity. First, determine what your students can do. In this case, if we're doing this type of activity for intermediate high school students in the US or for second year college, they should not need major uh, modifications. Uh, however, they may be necessary for other students in context. And also I like, to, I like to point out that sometimes people think that, well, we can't do translation with maybe Spanish 101 or Spanish 202 in any kind of meaningful way. Sure, we don't do that. But then students in 101 and 102, well, they don't have the knowledge, advanced knowledge to do translation. We can do that too. I mean, we have to modify it, do it in a form way. They can't do the same things, but it's definitely possible. Um, okay. So um, determine if you have content that you can build around this type of lesson uh, could go well with lessons that have cultural content or that have a focus on how to obtain and report information. Very typical in communicative language teaching. So even if you're still using communicative language teaching, of course not that also, that only uses the L2, but if it's okay for you to use the L1 and the L2, then this will fit really nicely with that type of, of negotiation of meaning and obtaining and reporting information. 
objectives. For this type of activity, we have, of course, negotiation of meaning and also literacy, which would include reading comprehension, writing, and organizing and deciding skills, because we're asking the students to write, to create a, a survey, to create a questionnaire, and then they'll have to read it, they'll have to administer it, so there's reading. And there's also, of course, oral function where they're administering the questionnaire to Spanish speakers. A little more specific, uh, more detail, and I'm not gonna go through all of them, but if we could, if we wanted to use a lot of teachers in high school, I'm gonna use their actual um, standards. So it is possible to use those. And here I've, I've listed some of those uh, objectives. Um, you know, are more specific, like I said, what it is that they're doing. They're, they know and use relevant vocabulary and grammatical structures to write a survey. They translate a questionnaire, they communicate orally. And also I think highlight this one is important that the students begin to understand that the communicative connection between the language in the classroom and outside the classroom. Some students see the language in the classroom as something artificial that is not used out there. Maybe not so much in certain parts of the US where there's a lot of bilingual speakers, but in other areas, this has happened. I've, I've heard students comment on that when they go study abroad to realize that language is, is a living thing, right? So I think this will help them um, stay away from that, that, that view. Um, I guess determine your goal objectives modifications are possible. And, and if we have beginning students, instead of asking them to translate a whole questionnaire or, or to write a whole questionnaire in Spanish, they could be they could be provided with a questionnaire, a partial translation where they don't have to do all the work. They just have to do a few uh, a few uh, sections of that questionnaire. Now we plan the activity. Well, and in this case, in terms of materials, it's simple. We just come up with a worksheet with instructions and directions for the students, although we have to do it carefully, right, and, and, and well. So example, some uh, instructions on what we could use here. Um, first um, step, we ask the students to brainstorm about types of music, genres, and groups of three or four, right? So we get them ready, we warm them up a little bit to think about this topic. And we ask them to um, um, tell us what those, those music genres are called in Spanish. If they wanted to, they could look it up in, in the dictionary and find the translations. And we ask them to think about it. What do you notice about musical uh, genre in the terms of of course, we're hoping that in many cases they'll say, well, sometimes we use English words, so we get them to think about it. So the next step would be to ask them to write a survey. Uh, they're going to have to write a survey in English and then in Spanish. And then the objective is to determine what types of music their peers listen to and if music preferences are going to be influenced by the language their peers speak. So we give them an overview of what it is that they're going to do. And we say, OK, your task here is to do a study. You're going to find out this information and then you're gonna to have to report on it. So more specifically, in terms of procedures, the next step would be in your assigned groups, assign a questionnaire in English, which does the following. It explains the purpose of the questionnaire, because this is what they're gonna, they're gonna administer it to the subjects, the participants. And uh, the questionnaire also has to, have, has to ask questions that will allow us to obtain the following information. Age of the participant, gender, first language, second language of any, and the self-assessed level of proficiency. They'll be asking the person, okay, how well do you speak that language on a one to five scale? But also, it will also ask about the home language. Do you speak a different language at home? Um, and what are your favorite musical genres? Once they've, they've written the questionnaire, we ask them to print it, copy it, and choose one or two people in the group who orally administer the questionnaire to English speaking friends and acquaintances between 15 and 20 years old, and then write down the responses. Uh, now we get to the second part where they translate that into Spanish. And then they do the same thing, they print or copy it, and then they choose one or two people in the group who have administered the questionnaire to Spanish speaking peers and write down the responses. So they the questionnaire in English, we told them what we needed, what information uh, we need in that questionnaire. Then we asked them to translate into Spanish, administer English, administer in Spanish, and now they'll have to report the results. On so their groups, we're going to ask them to write a bar graph and flow sheets with the following elements bars for English and Spanish speaking participants, 
and sections for each type of music. Then they'll have to report um, their results and each group will present the results to the class. We'll make sure that every each member of the group must participate and speak. And then we need to have a plan ahead to see who will present which part of the graph. We'll give them a little bit of, of a framework for the type of, of um, report that we want them to do. And an example, you know, each person could describe the results for two separate types of music. And in Spanish, we give them a little bit of a framework saying so many person personas que hablan inglés pequeñas la música rock and then ex personas que hablan español pequeñas la música rock okay uh, we ask them at the end once they've done this presentation class with bar graphs to write the paragraph or at least a sentence summarizing the results um, and of course we'll give a little more um, of a direction here telling them when you need a topic sentence you need a concluding sentence and then they turn in a printed copy. All right, so now that was a little bit about how to uh, prepare the materials. There's, like I said, it was simple. It's just a matter of having them uh, all the information well organized in a, in, a, in a worksheet and guiding the students through it. Um, it's also important to notice that this activity could be enriched. Uh, it could be incorporated into certain specific units. And for instance, in advanced placement Spanish, like in Spanish language um, component, uh, and, and this could be part of personal and public identity units. It could be, like I said in the beginning, uh, culture units or also uh, when we talk about songs uh, and culture. Okay, assessment. Uh, we've created sample rubrics for group work, for individual work, for combinations of group members, and that's part of the, uh, the textbook. Uh, but, you know, this is something, this is just an example for something that you should always do when you decide, you should always do when you decide to have a room how to assess it. Now I'll reflect a little bit on how did it, how all of this go in the classroom? Were the directions and explanations clear? Was the timing okay? Um, going back to the objectives that we stated at the beginning that we wanted to meet with this activity, were they accomplished or not? Uh, what went well? What could have gone differently? And also importantly, did you accomplish anything through translation that you may not have accomplished otherwise? Uh, when we did this, uh, we had this activity in the high school where my my, my colleague used to there off to teach, and and we noticed that there were interesting discussions between the heritage and non heritage speakers, especially at the cultural level. This was a mixed classroom. Uh, as they are in many high schools in the United States, where they have both their speakers. So this created a lot of discussion um, between the amongst the different groups with different populations. All right. So now that I've given you a little bit of a sense of how can we, you know, train teachers um, to use translation in an informed way, give you know, a little bit of, of possible steps to follow, illustrate examples. I would also uh, like to emphasize that it's important that we teach, we train language teachers on the basics of translation and translation, mm -hmm. not just the methodology on how to incorporate translation activities within their language plans, but also to know a little bit we, about translation from the point of view of translation studies. Uh, we have basic uh, fundamental kind of elementary type of books out there. One of them, you know, maybe sorry for tooting my own horn a little bit. <laughs> of translation, which is usually this book I, I hear that is being used for basic courses in translation. And, and, and uh, But one, one intention of mine when I wrote this book was not just for, for courses and for students, but also for teachers that may not know enough about translation from the translation studies point of view and to start to learn a little bit about this. So this would be, I think, helpful. And there are other books out there, of course, um, that will help teachers um, um, understand a little bit about translation studies, get their, speak their interest and therefore, you know, get them reading more about translation studies. Uh, what do institutions, what can institutions do? So we talked about, teacher training, incorporating, helping teachers make informed use of translation activities in language classroom. But also I mentioned that uh, what inst institutions can also focus on courses, programs, and research programs. Um, 
for instance, in terms of courses, there are pretty nice um, books and curriculum out there. Uh, some of them are newer than, and, and others of some of these other books. Last century, beginning of the, what? well, we have new, new editions, right? But they're not something that was developed in the last few years. But so we have a, we have a, broad, a, a broad array of books that we can use at the end advanced level like Lux and Lunsford, Carleris et al, Natalia Davis in Colina 2003. And these are four courses on translation in the language curriculum. So I see on the one hand that we can incorporate translation activities and language teaching. And we can also have the language curriculum in, in the language, in this case, Spanish, where at the 300, 400 more advanced level and then in college, students can actually move a little bit more towards the professional translation side of this is still learning language like in these books. And so examples, a much more recent book, you know, really full of resources. Um, I hear that there is a second edition of the work. Uh, so in addition to adding these types of courses to the curriculum, not just the courses to the, the more advanced, the 300, 400 level college curriculum, um, we have to think about programs in general and incorporate translation programs in, in, in conversation and communication with language courses, not as isolated, separate um, programs. And we have to think about flexible options, um, not just the traditional face-to-face. -face. Obviously now after COVID, uh, there's a lot more having to do or, or in, in the format of online or hybrid. But also, you know, let's think not just in terms of being you know, masters, but also certificate, credit, non-credit. There is, these days, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of innovation, in terms of what types of programs we can offer for different audiences. Programs. So I think there should be a lot more interest, and there is already, but it, it needs to grow in doctorates, not only in translation studies, but in related areas that can use uh, translation studies data and content in areas such as the second language acquisition and applied linguistics centers, like the six centers throughout the United States, uh, could actually do a lot of the work, uh, like Circle here did with us, a lot of work that has to do with translation. So, what are some examples of, of topics for research that some of these programs could undertake? Well, I can imagine all kinds of different uh, projects testing the effectiveness of translation and language teaching. I mentioned a number of benefits. Okay, this is pretty much theoretical, you know, it's conceptual. Let's go try it and let's see if translation actually uh, has beneficial um, effects in, in those areas. Um, today, uh, we have um, most of the studies deal and that research the effects of translation and language teaching deal with of linguistic benefits, a lot of them with vocabulary. So there's a lot of work that could be done to expand that and look at other types of benefits. All right. So something else that institutions can do is hire stakeholders, faculty program directors, that have an understanding of professional translation uh, in addition to language teaching and people who can actually build bridges and connect the two. That would really move these efforts uh, forward significantly. Something else that we noticed, that I've noticed also recently, is that um, students do a lot of service learning these days and internships. Mm -hmm. and a lot of the projects involved in these classes have to do with translation. So therefore, that's another place where we can do a little bit of teacher training for the teacher who's in charge of that internship and for the students in terms of translation. It would be good to uh, do a little bit of translation studies, very basic concepts so that students can approach translation with the knowledge that we have in the field and not just uh, from the point of view of a language instructor. And I would recommend also that we don't assume that all language teachers know about translation. Um, also, I would encourage institutions to offer training on language learning and teaching to um, TNI practitioners and scholars. It goes both ways. So what does language teachers need to uh, learn more about translation studies? Um, also the TNI practitioners that sometimes teach in programs because of their wealth of ex 
uh, would be would benefit from knowing a little bit about language teaching and type of students that they may have in their classrooms who have gone through language teaching programs. Um, also, I think it would be important for organizations to do some of what we're doing here, some of what Rutgers is doing, organize workshop webinars with technology these days is very easy to um, expand the reach of those presentations, collaborative projects through grants and institutes. In short, you know, sharing the dissemination of resources and information. So just um, begin to um, starting to wrap up this talk a little bit, I uh, just wanted to mention some challenges and opportunities before I conclude. Um, you know, it's very exciting to talk about all of this, but we also need to be aware of the challenges that might come our way. Um, one of them that I see is the importance of using translation in an informed manner. So we don't revert to grammar translation. Teachers go back to what they're used to doing. So it's important that we train them in, 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 in showing how to teach translation in an informed way that does not go back to grammar. Another challenge will be negotiating and navigating disciplinary boundaries between the teachers and the academics and the practice translators uh, that have not always been in contact. Now we put them in contact and we're gonna have differences coming, arising from the differences in field. But we do have a lot of opportunities. I can see, and probably you can see this in the talk that, that I have uh, this talk, that the borders between translation for language teaching on the one hand and for professional purposes as translation studies and professional translation are starting to sort of become more porous. They're, it's not as clear as it was just 20 or 30 years ago that the separation between the two. And it's good to have that separation at the extremes, but we want them to connect in the middle and have more of a continuum. So the last decades have clearly highlighted important points of contact, such as service learning that I just uh, mentioned of the commonality of having a lot of service learning projects and internships that have to do with translation, and also the lived experiences of heritage language students. Translation can be seen as a fifth skill in language learning. That's another way to connect and a bridge between the language classroom and translation. And just quickly to conclude, because I think I've gone over to 45 that I promised, <laughs> I hope that I have presented some informed predictions about the future of translation and language teaching. And I try to do this against the backdrop of a broader notion, a broader conceptualization of translation, new language teaching methodologies, which are more friendly to translation in a more diverse multilingual view of language learning. My expectation is that increased activity of research and teaching and teacher training will result in more frequent and deeper connections between the two fields, the fields of language teaching and translation studies, and definitely in a much richer and much more nuanced understanding of the fields for the benefit of multilingual students and societies. With that, sorry, thank you very much for your attention. And I hope uh, that this has created enough ideas and, 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 uh, and questions that we can have maybe 10 minutes for, for discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. That what? was fascinating. Can you hear me, Sonia? Yes, I can hear you. Shall I stop the share? Uh, sure, yeah. 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 So I'm I gonna, like, everybody can see my face while I'm talking. Um, yeah, thank you so much. That was fascinating, not only for the overview at the beginning, which I think was very, very good to have for those uh, who are not familiar with this field. But also, like, of course, about the potential and possibilities uh, that you know the synergy between translation and language teaching brings, and also like the forecast of the future. I was very excited about that part, like all the things that I, I like. Kind of like how you did like a SWOT analysis, almost like yeah. this is the strengths, uh, opportunities, and threats. And I was excited about the opportunities um, of language teachers uh, and second language acquisition professionals learning about translation. I think maybe it's also like a two-way alley where translation yeah. studies people have to like also like collaborate and learn more about two language, uh, two, uh, second language acquisition and language teaching. So I'm excited about that. So I don't want to use my power position to make questions, though I have a few. Uh, so I'm going to open the floor uh, for the public to to question, like to open, like to make, sorry, make questions. Uh, both online and here in the room. 
So if any has if anyone has any question, can open the camera and the mic, or if too shy, just the mic. And uh, here in the room, uh, and you can also use the chat. Sorry. Oh, Christine. Christina, hi. <laughs> Very nice seeing you, Sonia. Nice um, seeing you. Really, uh, thank you for the, for this presentation. And I was curious about whether or your thoughts on using the model that you've proposed, the book that, that you've recently published, as a preparation for translation and interpreting programs. So yeah. we use something like that to get our, and I'm thinking about heritage speakers, which is the main population that we have on my institution. Would you think that that would be a good idea to prepare them better to then enter a program in translation and interpreting? You mean the 2015 book? No, no I was talking about the using translation in language courses. You know, one, it's a it's a big, I mean, it'll prepare them, but over time. So if, let's say if you want to use that one during their second or third year and then in their fourth year, or maybe as graduate students, they, they start into um, the uh, translation and interpreter program. I think there's a big between the two. So it'll prepare in a way, I guess I can say that it'll prepare students in general, right? So if we start having activities of that type from you know day one, Spanish 101, Spanish 102, and then 200 level, 300 level, by the time they're ready to start translation, maybe as, a, as professionals, maybe the as seniors or even at the graduate level, they will have a better understanding. So we'll prepare them but more in a, in a way of creating a culture in language teaching and in language classes amongst language students and language teachers that is more understanding of, of translation and what translation is. It moves them away from that idea of grammar translation into a more communicative type of professional translation, right? So, but, so in that very general way, you know, of a culture change within language development. Mm -hmm. yes. um, if you're thinking about being more prepared, not in terms of perspectives, but just being prepared to take courses in professional translation, I would start with courses, more, more advanced courses like Carreres or Maria, Maria Gonzalez Davis, or even my own book. You know, those other books that have a little more and a little more advanced. So those would be more of the, the, the in-between, right? So we start with the, with the open textbook. We start introducing the informed use of translation in the classroom. We started to create some culture change. And then towards the more advanced uh, junior, senior years. Now we have learning Spanish through translation, a lot more of, of translation, professional translation activities, right? And those prepare them to then go into a professional mm -hmm. program. I don't know if that's- I was, I was actually thinking, getting them ready to start a translation program, but because your 2015 book, I would think yeah. of using it in a translation program, not, not as a preparation. I was- thinking of getting them ready to like have their language skills as a way of developing their language skills to then start uh, not not working as a professionals, but studying. Yeah, so then it would develop, I mean, they would focus on translation as a thin skill, right? And that prepares them, you know, to move into, yes, mm -hmm. which we have not done. You know, we focused on the read and write and speaking. Yeah, mm -hmm. and listening. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to be teaching a heritage speakers course during the summer okay. and I'm getting ideas in case you want to collaborate and research. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that might be, yeah, yeah. Don't hesitate to reach out, you know, for ideas or comments if you just want to talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Christina, for the question and the answer. Uh, we have a question in the room. So, Miguel. Um, you want to go ahead and ask. Yes. You can look at the camera, I guess. Uh, which one? Yeah, I know yeah, that one. I don't know if we will. Uh, thanks, uh, Sonia, as always, for you're, a fascinating me. You're cutting out a little bit. Um, where's the mic? I don't know where the mic is. I think the mics are there. So thanks a lot for a fascinating presentation. Um, I really, really appreciate you accepting our invitation, as I've told you before. Um, 
And I want my question is at epistemological level because I'm working now a lot on trans creation, trans languages, mm-hmm. trans medialities, trans model, you know, all the trans fix. And from my perspective, and it's good that you mentioned it, for example, the work from Gonzalez Davis, the task based approach uh, in translation that ties with what Christina said, that is, you know, to me, trans languages as a whole. And what we published in some areas in this kind of splinter, whether we divide translation, or we incorporate as translation, do you see translanguaging more as a language learning uh, part, or do you see it as a sub part of translation, meaning that is something that is always happening in translation classrooms? Yeah, I see it. As, yeah, I see it as both, you know? It, of course, that what we do in translation is always translanguage. It, you know why ever do you when they do translanguage in 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 uh in the language teaching classroom it's not always necessarily translation right yeah and, you know they may do it they talk about different modalities you know so you can translanguage between oral and visual and gestures and 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 you know different and different modalities they're not necessarily involved two different languages so mm-hmm. And language is linguistic in terms of the linguistic system, right? Um, you can also do all kinds of different things, sisters and situations even within the same language. So I see all of that as translanguaging, right? And it doesn't necessarily involve translation of languages the way we do it in translation, right? So I see translanguaging as, as a broader thing. And in translation, of course, all of it is translanguaging. Isn't that a contradiction then? If one is all of the other one and the other one is like something else? Say that again. Isn't that a contradiction if one is part of the other and but the other has something else? I'm not sure I you were cutting That's up. Fine. That's fine. No, oh, go I'm ahead. Now. Is it no go ahead? <laughs> we'll talk some of the we'll talk some of the time. I don't know if no, I don't see it, you know, I don't see it as a contradiction. I see it as one of them more broader than the other. But now, okay. of course, if you go back to Jacobson, you know, he talked about different types of translation. So I'm, I'm focusing yeah, more on the, on the linguistic element, right? Thinking about a lot of the translation that we do in translation studies focused mm-hmm. on languages, right? Mm-hmm. Linguistic elements, right? But of course, he saw it in a much broader view. So if you go back to that definition of translation, then they are the same. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Chat or more questions? I if we have a little bit of time, so I'll <laughs> I'll make a, a final question, I guess. Um, so I have actually two questions. One was about um, the the activity that you made uh, with the high school students. And you mentioned at the end that there was like a lot of discussion between heritage speakers and non-heritage speakers. Mm-hmm. And I was curious about that if you have like more, if you can like elaborate on that, because as a teacher or you know instructor of translation, we we usually have heritage speakers in class. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's difficult sometimes to know what kind of like different skills they might need or you know where we have to like or we have to strengthen in one group and the other so I was interested in that and then the second question if you have time otherwise (laughs) I know it's a lot uh was about uh what I said in the in the summary about translation studies people learning more about like second language acquisition and language Mm -hmm. teaching if it has to be like a two-way alley where I mean, I understand, yes, but uh, I just wanted to your input um, input on that and how we could collaborate on that, like you know, in the in the translation classroom. So that would be like the other round, like instead of like translation in the language classroom, you know, more doing more language acquisition and um, language teaching in the translation classroom. All right. In the first one, how students interacted. What we found is, of course, the heritage students bring in all their personal experiences. Mm-hmm. So the students would, the heritage speakers would uh, contribute all of that, you know, talking about, you know, in my family, this and my family, that, right? And this is, this is how these, how things work in my grandmother and, uh, 
our, our town, you know, they have all their lived experiences, more of an anecdotal kind of thing. And that's, that's important because it brings in all the cultural elements, right? Mm -hmm. Then speakers have more of an understanding of the metalinguistic part of, of the so Sometimes they can help them with structures, they can discuss, you know, how the subject or the verb or things like that go in a translation, whereas the other kids usually do not do so well in that area. So they have those two aspects that I think contribute and complement each other. I think heritage speakers also help the non-heritage understand the point that I was trying to make that sometimes a lot of L2 learners who don't have any familiar connection with the language see the language as something which is uh, not real, right? Something that they, they do in the classroom like the other things that they do in an academic context. So the heritage speakers help them bring in that notion of language as something real and connected to the world. So those are the things that we saw. The cultural element is essential, you know, and being able to relate, the students being able to talk about their experiences. You know, in other classes that have nothing to do with language, you know, students often bring in their own experiences dealing with whatever it might be. But in language classes, for the ones who are two learners, unless they've been to study abroad or things like that, there isn't much that they can connect between um, what they're learning and their, their, their experience, right? Heritage speakers really help in that sense and they bring all the culture. So that's the way I see it. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah, um, okay. I, I agree. <laughs> I, always, I always like that because I see that even in non-translation classes that I've had, you know, even phonetics, phonology, they supplement each other, they complement each other really mm -hmm. nice. Very well. Um, so, okay, and this your question had to do with uh, people who come from the translation studies uh, side from that field, and then they may have students in the classroom that still acquire the language, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it was yeah. and how I yeah. feel about that. You know, that, I think that's just sort of a myth in the sense that translation studies people have always said, oh, you'll have to acquire the language and you have to be a perfect bilingual before you even get into the translation classes. But we do know that that's not the case, that, that language acquisition doesn't work that way. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not static. So people are always learning the language, right? Even people who are perfectly bilingual um, they may find that their L1 is weaker after some time and there's some attrition. So I think the important part is for, for translation studies people to understand that there's there's that kind of evolution that you can't just say that you now you're in translation and you, do, you can't learn. Uh, you already have learned it all and you're done with it. So they're gonna have students that are gonna need to learn a little bit. Of course, then you'll have to do a match and make sure that you're not language learning because then you can't do translation learning, right? You can't do translation acquisition if you're focusing on language acquisition. So you have to figure out where your course fits in terms of language skills mm -hmm. and make sure that you don't spend too much time on language skills, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you're still going to have to be dealing with language no matter what. And I think we need to get over that myth. Uh, that there's no more language learning when it comes to translation. I think that uh, if we bring back translation into language teaching, that will become more obvious. Mm -hmm. um, it can help us learn the language, not just in the language classroom, but also in translation classes. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. Uh, I would love to continue this conversation for hours, <laughs> but we have to, I mean, for respect of your time and because we have other things going on today. Thank you again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you to all the attendees. I, I copied in the chat like some information. The chat, uh, sorry, the, the talk is uh, recorded. So you'll be uh, getting like a, a link with the recording uh, so that you can take notes and review everything. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone. Happy translation, International Translation Day again, and have Thanks. a good day. <laughs> <laughs>